Good morning and we continue landmarks in English literature. It is a very broad term, I am aware of that, uh, literature in English or English literature, but uh, right now I will be focusing on English literature as promised earlier that the first few hours would be entirely devoted to the so called English literature. We will also look at uh, major works such as um, the Bible. Okay. So, uh, we have already touched upon Chaucer and the Canterbury Trails and uh, today I am going to look at another um, some of the few major works of literature in English or in, in English literature. Now, uh, as usual let us start with a little warm up and some exercises. So, please look at the slide here. I want you to identify the speaker. But after you have killed these suitors in your palace, either by treasury or openly with the sharp bronze, then you must take up your well shaped oar and go on a journey until you come where there are men living who know nothing of the sea and who eat food that is not mixed with salt, who never have known ships, whose cheeks are painted purple, who never have known well shaped oars which act for ships as wings do. And I will tell you a very clear proof and you cannot miss it when as you walk some other wayfarer happens to meet you and says you carry a winnow fan on your bright shoulder, then you must plant your well shaped oar in the ground and render ceremoniously sacrifice to the Lord Poseidon, one ram and one bull and a mount of souls, a boar pig and make your way home again and render holy hecatombs to the immortal gods who hold the wide heaven, all of them in order. Death will come to you from the sea in some altogether unwarlike way and it will end you in the ebbing time of a sleek old age. Your people about you will be prosperous. All this is true that I tell you. Identify the speaker. Who could be the speaker? Look at some of the key words here. See, remember in uh, exams like this, you have to look at certain key words. There might be overlap. We live in times um, where so much of literature borrows from uh, the great works, the works by great masters. So, this language, these words can be from anywhere, but look at the language, look at what time does it denote, look at uh, certain words, what words are these, the key words and then look at these choices. Who could be the speaker here? Tiresias? Zeus, Apollo, Delphic Oracle, Greek mythology. Please do not ignore or neglect your Greek mythology. Next slide, please look at it. Name the king here. In Greek mythology, this king killed his brother's sons and cooked them, saved their hands and feet, he tricked his brother into eating the flesh of his own sons and then taunted him with their hands and feet. Who was the king? Thaistis, Agamemnon, Hector, Atreus. Next, identify the queen here. Though married to Theseus, she fell in love with Hippolytus, Theseus' son by another woman, but Hippolytus rejected her. In revenge, she wrote Theseus a letter that claimed Hippolytus had raped her. Who was the queen? Electra, Clytemenstra, C. Fedora, D. Ariadne. Next, identify the book here, a landmark seminal work. A king should be strong like a lion and cunning like a fox. Since a prince should know how to use the beast's nature wisely, he ought of beast to choose both the lion and the fox. For the lion cannot guard himself from the toils nor the fox from wolves. He must therefore be a fox to discern toils and a lion to drive off wolves. The ruler must adopt special techniques in his movements. Choose the correct response. 
Rousseau's social contract, Machiavelli's The Prince, Plato's Republic, Mussolini's My Autobiography. Next one, who were the sirens? The sirens were, and choose the right answer, nymphs who devoured men, dangerous creatures who lured nearby sailors with their enchanting music and voices to shipwreck on the rocky coast of their island. C. The raped sisters who were also known as the sobbing women. D. Sisters whose song lured sailors and made them forget their past. Who were the sirens? Next one. Who said the following? As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. This is from Shakespeare. Gloucester in King Lear, King Lear in King Lear, Horatio in Hamlet, Othello in Othello. Who are the following lines about who is being discussed here? Lay her in the ground and let violets bloom from her lovely and pure flesh. I am telling you, you jerk priest, my sister will be an angel in heaven while you are howl howling in hell. This is said about Desdemona, B. Ophelia, C. Cordelia, D. Lady Macbeth. Number 8. Identify the poet. Lo, I the man whose muse Willom did mask as time her taught in lowly shepherd's weeds am now and false of fa far unfitter task for trumpets turn to change, change mine oaten reeds and sing of knights and ladies gentle deeds whose prayers have slept in silence long who presses have slept in silence, silence long, me all to mean the sacred muse areeds to blazon broad amongst her learned throng, a learned throng, fierce wars and faithful loves shall moralize my song. Help then, O holy virgin chief of, chief of nine, thy weaker novice to perform thy will. Lay forth out of thine everlasting siren the antique rolls which there lie hidden still of fairy knights and fairest tanquil, whom that most noble Briton prince so long sought through the world and suffered so much ill that I must rue his undeserved wrong. O help thou my weak wit and sharpen my dull tongue. Invocation to the muse, a very common practice for people who aspire to write epic poetry. So, choose the right answer. Who is the poet here? Philip Sidney, John Milton, P. B. Shelley, Edmund Spencer. Next one. Who was Atlanta of Greek mythology? What was her speciality, her characteristic feature? A. A great beauty, B. Poetess, C. Murderess, D. Huntress. Next one. Identify the author here. But virtue, by the bare statement of its actions, can so affect men's minds as to create at once both admiration of the things done and desire to imitate the doers of them. The goods of fortune we would possess and would enjoy, those of virtue we long to practice and exercise. We are content to receive the former from others, the latter we wish others to experience from us. Moral good is a practical stimulus. It is no sooner seen than it inspires an impulse to practice and influences the mind and character, not by a mere imitation which we look at, but by the statement of the fact creates a moral purpose which we form. Choose the correct response. Plato, Aristotle, C. Machiavelli, D. Plutarch. So, coming to the answers now. Um, the first question, the first one where the prophecy is done, this is from Homer's Odyssey and the speaker is Tiresias. There may be some confusion because all are Greek stalwarts, gods, Apollo, Zeus and the Delphic oracle. So, it may be a little confusing. This is Tiresias, the blind prophet's speech. Uh, the king who killed his brother's children because the brother committed adultery with the king's wife is Atreus, D. Atreus. And uh, the answer to 
The third question is Phaedra, Queen Phaedra, who fell in love with her stepson. And when he resisted her advances, she reported to her husband that uh, uh, he had tried, the boy had tried to seduce her. This plot, the subplot was, uh, this theme was a subplot in Mo, um, sorry, Desire Under the Elms by Eugene O'Neill, the American playwright, 20th century playwright. So, see Phaedra. Prince should be a lion and a fox, is from, is B, Machiavelli is the prince. And who were the sirens? Answer is B, dangerous creatures who lured who lured nearby sailors with their enchanting, enchanting, sorry, enchanting music and voices and shipwrecked them on the rocky coast of their island. As flies to uh, wanton boys, very famous lines, but King Lear did not mistakenly assumed to be King Lear's lines. They are not King Lear's lines, but Gloucester from King Lear. So, it is indeed from King Lear, but not spoken by the protagonist, the lead protagonist, the main protagonist by Gloucester. And uh, the dead sister, question 7, it be Ophelia from Hamlet. Eighth is D, Edmund Spencer, Fairy Queen, the invocation. You should know Edmund Spencer and the archaic looking spellings and words. Okay? And there is a, a, a famous quotation by a quip by the great wit Ben Johnson, not Samuel Johnson, but Ben Johnson. And he complained that Spencer writ no language, but they do have a certain poetic effect, making beautiful old rhyme in praise of. Um, ladies dead and lovely nights. Okay. So, um, uh, the, the spellings should tell you that it is archaic and Elizabethan. Atlanta was huntress, so D is the answer and the last one, the moral and how people should lead their lives is from Plutarch's lives. So, D, D is the answer, 10 D Plutarch is lives or parallel lives. It is a collection of biographies of famous Greek and Roman soldiers, legislators, orators and statesmen. Okay, bio parallel lives parallel. By comparing a famous Roman with a famous Greek, Plutarch wanted to establish certain model patterns of behavior. You know how great people behave, these orators, legislators, statesmen, soldiers, what do they do? So, from the Greeks and the Romans, a comparison. So, that is their lives and a pattern that how model people behaved. The idea was to encourage certain uh, patterns of morality, behavior and attitude and encourage mutual respect between Greeks and Romans who were often at war with each other. Plutarch's lives is an influential work. 22 pairs and 4 single biographies have survived and one of the most well known comparisons is between the Greek orator Demosthenes with the Roman orator Cicero. But remember Plutarch was not a true historian in the modern sense, but a moralist concerned to portray the distinctively Roman virtues. His subjects especially Rome's builders such as Fabius Maximus. Marcellus and Cato the elder, they illustrate his themes of Roman valor, determination, courage. So, that is what he wanted to establish. But at the same time, on the contrary, he also wanted to establish that its character is the character that leads to the downfall. So, people like Sulla and Antony, they are the ones to be held responsible for destroying the republic. Okay, so, from here I will introduce you to one great uh, landmark of uh, English literature, the fairy queen. We have just seen the invocation uh, as uh, already uh, talked about early in one of our early classes. 
uh, it is an allegorical epic by Edmund Spencer. Uh, it was written in 1590 and 1596, so both, okay, and left unfinished, one of the most outstanding poems. So, it's, it was left unfinished, remember that. It's, uh, the plan was to write a long chivalric allegory of philosophical and moral nature, a national epic to glorify England. You remember, you are talking about Chaucer and national identity and those years kinds of things, so how language started. Uh, developing, how national identities started um, to come into the play and how uh, pride in England was foregrounded. So, that is the characteristic, that is there is a pattern of literature from Chaucer onwards to establish these things. So, uh, this is a national epic to glorify England and its Queen Elizabeth. He uh, proposed to set forth in 12 books the 12 moral virtues repre represented by 12 knights of Arthur's court. Actually one is a woman, but uh, 12 great people, King Arthur's court. And Spencer's uh, artistic ambition was to uh, compete with people like Ariosto and Tasso and even Virgil in you know while writing an epic. Like Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, the English poem was conceived on a grand scale as a romance, an allegory. The idea was to establish superiority over Ariosto and uh, um, authors of antiquity. Um, the idea was to be consistent and portray the integrity of an idealist or idealized hero to fashion a gentleman of noble person in virtuous and gentle discipline. Now, only six of the proposed twelve books were completed and within the six, um, the allegory is not consistent, certain scholars dispute its uh, complex meanings. The narrative leaps in between, you know, in media rest like going back and forth and all, just like an epic. The hero is Prince Arthur representing magnanimity or magni ma magnificence. The champions are the Red Cross Knight, uh, Sir Gwen, Britomart, that is a female uh, warrior, chastity, Triumph, Campbell, Artegnel. So, virtues like justice, temperance, chastity, friendship, courtesy, these were the idea was to establish the uh, import, the importance of these virtues. So, each uh, noble knight is engaged in a single separate adventure, but on their way they all accept uh, or face challenges. Some kill giants and dragons, some are misled by magicians, they rescue ladies, fight with the enemies. Now, look at the parallel between this allegory and every man, the pilgrim's progress, error, pride, envy, despair, guile, avarice, they encounter these people before mean objectives are achieved. So, the equation of each knight with one of the moral virtues is made very clear, but Spencer was too great an artist to stop here. He also expounded the system of Christian ethics and wish to incorporate in his own words Aristotle's schemes of virtues and vices and Plato's ideal wor world. He also added contemporary persons, people, events, um, virtues, politics, religions, religious beliefs, ethics, ethical beliefs and education also. So, thus one allegorical figure may mean many things and one real person may appear in several allegorical disguises. For example, Elizabeth the Queen is Gloriana, the fairy queen from whose court the adventures start and she is also Una, U N A um, symbolizing truth. So, the true Anglican church that is what she represents. She also at one uh, level represents Britomart that is chastity and Bitfibe again chastity. 
So, in other words, it is uh, like it was the order of the day to praise the then reigning ruler. Much has been uh, said about the techniques. So, Fairy Queen combines excellent verse technique with the creation of a highly effective form the Spenserian stanza. You should know what is a Spenserian stanza. Many a time the rhyme and meters may be questioned. Sometimes there are questions regarding the identify the meter. The so blank verse iambic pentameter, hexameter, Spenserian stanzas, a sonnets and all these uh, questions often are often asked in competitive exams. Onomatopoeia is also common as well as other types of sound effects, vowel sequences, devices of alliteration, assonances and rhyme. You should know what is onomatopoeia which is a word that imitates the sound or suggests the source of the sound that it describes. Here is a, an excellent rendition of the fairy queen, look at the link here. So, um, from the fairy queen, um, let me take you uh, to the growth of the medieval literature which precedes sort of uh, the fairy queen which is the Elizabethan um, seminal work of the Elizabethan period. But uh, let me also now uh, refer or at least scratch the surface of the growth of the medieval literature. So, um, Perhaps some of you have heard of La Chanson de Roland, okay? the song of Roland. It is an old English or sorry French epic that is probably the earliest chanson de geste, you know song of love, song of gesture. Okay? So, uh, it was written in uh, 1100 uh, century somewhere around that. Uh, it is considered the masterpiece of the genre. The poem's probable author was a Norman poet Turol, T U R O L D, whose name is introduced in its last line. Uh, the poem takes the historical battle of uh, Ronces Wells. You can look up these uh, names, um, Ronces Wells, uh, that happened in 778 AD and uh, that is a subject of La Chanson de Roland. This was the period when singers and poets travelled across the land okay, in Europe. They travelled the rough roads of Europe um, at the time of the crusades, the historic battle between the Arabs and uh, the Christians. So, uh, these singers and poets are now generally or commonly known as the troubadour, T R O B A D O U R, troubadour. They were the lyric poets of southern France, northern Spain, and northern Italy, uh, writing in the official language of their line. So, uh, what were they doing? They were traveling from one part of their country or one part of Europe to another taking travelling by road and singing about the valours of the king, the glories of the nation. So, they were the troubadours. They flourished from the late 11th to the uh, late 13th century. Their social influence was extremely uh, palpable in the history of medieval poetry. They were favoured at the courts they had great freedom of speech. They occasionally intervened even in the political sphere of society of their land, but their great achievement was to create uh, around the ladies of the court an aura of cultivation and amenity and all this had not been done before. So, they were the ones who sang songs of the beauties of the courtly la court ladies. Okay, so, we, I have been referring to the term courtly love, it all started with this. So, far and wide the praises uh, of the beauty, the beauty of these women would be praised uh, and then uh, that would create an aura around them. 
the uh, they would also sing about the uh, splendor of the court and uh, chivalry of the nobility so they were like uh, creating an image it was very much an image building exercise Trubadur poetry formed uh, uh, one of the most brilliant schools that ever fl flourished and it was to influence all later European lyrical poetry. So, um, it was to influence later on things like uh, works like the fairy queen and works of um, great poets such as Philip Sidney again who was an Elizabethan poet. One of the most influential works ever written and I cannot uh, just in, uh, emphasize on the importance or significance of the Bible. The Bible of course and uh, as a students of literature we have to understand what is the Bible. So, uh, please do not assume that this is a, a religious kind of talk, we are looking at uh, the Bible as a a great work that we all acknowledge, but also it is uh, even for the students of literature it is of great importance. So, um, the uh, uh, questions based on the Bible may occasionally be asked, it is better to be familiar with what is there in the Bible. So, the Bible is divided into two parts, the Old Testament identical with the law, the prophets and the writings that make up the Jewish scriptures and the second part is the New Testament comprising the earliest documents uh, existing on life and teaching of um, Jesus and the establishment of the Christian church. The Old Testament is longer and richer in literary types than the New presenting besides the tremendous sweep of its histories, the minute detail of its law codes and the high ethical doctrines of the prophetic books, the lyric poetry of Psalms and the song of Solomon, the wisdom literature of Proverbs and the Ecclesiastics and the dramatic dialogue of Job, the apocalyptic vision of Daniel and the tale of short stories, nowhere as richly developed um, as in the story of Ruth. So, these are the stories that you should know. So, story of Ruth, Daniel, Job, Cain and Abel, what are these? So, have a, a passing acquaintance with these stories. Please let me reiterate, we are looking at the Bible as a great masterpiece which has in, influenced literature of all uh, centuries even till this day. So, we just cannot uh, hope to master English literature without having some acquaintance with the Bible. So, that is our interest today. Um, the first books uh, of the Old Testament are Genesis, Exodus, um, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. So, these are the books that you should know what is, what these are all about, what is the gist of these. Together they are all called the Pentateuch 5. No? So, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. They are the narratives describing creation and the uh, primeval history of the world and then specifically to the children of, they turn uh, specifically to the children of Israel whose fortunes they relate from the call of Abraham to the death of Moses on the wilderness journey that followed the flight out of Egypt. So, you should know that story of the creation that Genesis, Exodus and uh, the rest of it. So, the Pentateuch contains some of the most famous of stories including ancient traditions such as the building of the tower of Babel. Remember these words Babel, didactic legends such as the destruction of the cities of the plain, uh, literary masterpieces such as the tale of Joseph and his brethren and narratives of great religious importance such as the giving of the ten commandments on Mount Sinai. So, remember that all this mosaic code is set forth in these books which are called in the 
Jewish tradition the Torah or law. The Pentateuch represents the highest point ever attained by Hebrew prose, but Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings and the four books that follow are almost as great. The subject is the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the victories of the judges or chieftains against the tri uh, tribes. Also the establishment of the kingdom by Saul and David and its division after the death of Solomon and the history of Judah and Israel as far as the destruction of Jerusalem and the deportation of the uh, people to Babylon in 586 BC. So, dates are important. You never know what question you may be asked in what way. You want to score center marks, you have to look at, understand all these things. I keep on telling you, any kind of learning is a constant process. Nothing will happen one month before or three months before. So you have to be at it. So, all these are, if you are looking for very high scores in literature, it is a good idea not to neglect this very essential aspect. Remember, the most heroic figure in all these books is David, but there are other important also like you know the strong man Samson deceived by his uh, uh, lover Delilah, the child Samuel presented to the Lord in the temple and the prophet Elijah. Okay is a great figure of the decline, standing alone, succeeding against all the priests of Baal. Remember, in the Hebrew Bible, Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings are known as the former prophets in contrast to the latter prophets. These men taught the people directly in the name of God, expressing their thought in some of the most exalted poetry ever written and using striking symbols to emphasize it and these symbolism, these, these symbols, these imagery, this, they were to impact the best and the greatest of English poetry, or poetry in the English language. Now, um, these people, they were highly individualistic, they spoke with specific situations in mind, but they can be considered together as their basic theme that these stories uh, which are very highly individualistic and these speak these stories with specific situations, but considered together basic theme is always the necessity for righteousness. Okay. And in this respect Isaiah is probably the best known in part because of the great messianic passages in his in this volume traditionally regarded by Christians as fulfilled in the birth of Christ. The remaining books of the Old Testament classified in the Hebrew script, scriptures as the writings, you know, writings with a capital W are varied in nature. Some of, uh, some of the histories uh, are like Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah and uh, uh, others are short stories like Esther and dramatic account of a Jewish queen who risked her life to save her people. And of course, Ruth, a pastoral romance. The romantics, the English romantic poets were influenced by the story, the pastoral romances and they, you can directly trace the influence back to the story of Ruth. Ecclesiastes is a book of wisdom literature composed in deep pessimism in partly in prose and partly in poetry verse. As in Daniel whose narrative is famous for the episodes of the fiery furnace and the lion's den and then again you have Job, the famous Job, the Lord tested him for his faithfulness. Okay, so, you should know all these, there are parallel stories in perhaps most religions. So, Job has a prologue and an epilogue in prose, but is otherwise it is written in verse. In it, the ancient story of a perfect and upright man. So, again emphasis on righteousness, moral righteousness. So, this man who lost all that he had is made up, uh, is uh, uh, that the story is, this is the story for, uh, uh, that makes for the occasion for a philosophical examination of the problem of evil. Perhaps if you would like to look into our Indian epics, you may find some parallels. 
Coming to the New Testament, it possesses, uh, possesses neither the length nor the variety of the Old Testament. It is written almost entirely in prose and is comparat in comparatively um, uh, you know few forms, less variety. So, beginning with the Gospels attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke and uh, John, um, all they describe the life and teachings of Jesus and continues with the Acts of the Apostles. So, this history of the missionary labors of uh, Peter and Paul which ascribed traditionally to Luke was intended as a sequel to his gospel, though it serves equally well as an introduction to the epistles that follows in the next text and majority are the works of Paul whose epistle to the Romans heads the great series of his messages to the churches, the others being addressed to the Corinthians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians and Thessalonians. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, um, Philippians, Colossians and Thessalonians. At the end of the epistles, the New Testament closes with the revelation of John, a work filled with splendid apocalyptic visions resembling those of Daniel in Old Testament. Remember the Old Testament was first written in Hebrew except for certain Aramaic passages in the book, books of Ezra and Daniel, but the apocrypha were composed apparently for the most part in Greek which was the original language of the New Testament also okay, as far as we know. When Christian communities arose in the western provinces of the Roman Empire, the Bible was rendered into Latin for their use, the older versions finally giving way to the Vulgate, Vulgate V U L G A T E V capital. Okay, so, begun by Saint Jerome in AD 382, this version became the official scripture of the Roman Catholic Church. You should also know the history of the great protestant versions. So, the great protestant versions arose with the reformation. We will be doing that as we approach that period in, in the world history okay, and how all these uh, changes had influenced literature. So, the great Martin Luther, he completed his translation of the Bible into German in 1534. Remember the date 1534. And the committee of English scholars commissioned by King James to render the scripture anew finished their work in 1611. So, 1534 and uh, English scholars uh, commissioned by King James. So, therefore, we have the we have something called the King James Bible. And the uh, Bible was rendered anew in 1611. So, there is a version of King James's Bible. Now, there this is a translation known as the King's, King James or authorized version A and V capital soon came to be recognized as one of the glories of the English language and a model for much of the prose written subsequently in the English language. So, much of the literature that I have been talking about it can uh, you know it owes a lot to the King James's Bible authorized version Bible. It is a work of great and immense beauty and it is commonly used in courses in which the Bible is studied as literature. Based on the Hebrew and Greek originals as they were known, it also drew largely on earlier English translations particularly that of William Tyndale. The King James Version is the basis of the American Revised Standard Version completed in 1952. So, this is the history, this, these are the landmarks, okay, one of the greatest works and for the students of literature, one of the most significant works ever written, a work of immense power and great beauty. Um, so, um, that is about it for the Bible and I would uh, I also want to refer to um, something 
that I have written here, the printing press. Now, Gutenberg is uh, the name that you should know. Gutenberg, who set up his printing press, a historical landmark, one of the major inventions, one of the most important inventions ever, okay, the printing press, democratization of knowledge. Previously, learning was extremely difficult. People would not know where to get material from, but with the printing press, multiple copies could be made and uh, gradually books became affordable. So, we owe a lot to the pin printing press. Now, um, a term that you would often come across while preparing your exams in literature is the Ranaisa. One is the Reformation and another is the Ranaisa. Now, we are going to discuss Ranaisa in detail in our subsequent classes. But uh, for the purpose of today's class, just let me tell you, let me give you a very quick introduction. It was uh, like a rebirth, Renaissance. Nice, huh? So, nice is birth and rebirth of what? Of culture, of knowledge, of you know coming out from the dark ages, medieval ages and ushering in the new era. Okay, an immense development in science and technology, literature, culture and all domains uh, of inquiry. Uh, the spirit of Ranaisa spread to Germany, France, England and Spain in the late 15th and the 16th centuries. Two factors operated to speed up the spread of Ranaisa culture after 1450. One was the growing economic prosperity. So, thanks to the merchants and industrialization and second is the printing press. The first person to demonstrate the possibility of movable type was Johannes Gutenberg, who lived between 1398 to four, um, 1398 and 1468. 1398 to 1468. He was a former stone cutter and goldsmith. Uh, his uh, father wa, uh, father came from a noble family of Mainz in Germany. By 1452, with the aid of borrowed money uh, from someone called Johann first, Gutenberg began his famous Bible project. 200 copies of the two volume Gutenberg Bible were printed. It was an expensive and beautifully uh, brought out Bible, uh, rather the copies of the Bible and they were completed and sold at the 1455 Frankfurt Book Fair, an extremely famous event which is uh, around even nowadays Frankfurt Book Fair which is in practice even now, even today. So, uh, the Bibles, the first printed Bibles they were sold at the 1455 Frankfurt Book Fair. And uh, roughly 50 of all Gutenberg Bibles survive today. I, am, I may be wrong about the numbers, so you can look them up if you feel the need to. So, uh, that is about Gutenberg. At the same time, there was another in another part of the world away from the West something else was happening and that was the development of Japanese no theatre, no n o no uh, o with a bar on it. Around the same time from about 1460, it was a new style of drama, music and acting. It was created in Japan, no plays often written as n o h also are extremely intense in order to express something so abstract as an emotion, um, they do not rely, the actors and the writers do not rely on words. As the play progresses, dance and poetry are used to express the anguished emotion, the tortured heart. Okay, so, this, this is something that was happening when all these developments were happening in the other part of the world. So, it is very interesting to look at the parallel developments. If you will see what was happening in India at that time, what literature was done in during that point, 
um, it may give you some interesting answers. Other elements which co contributed uh, um, or contribute rather because no has not changed what it was then it is now they did not want to evolve or add anything to the practice. Okay, so, the elements which contribute to an intensification of the mood and emotion are the bare simplicity of the stage. No stage is bare and simple, it allows no distraction and costumes are always sumptuous and gorgeous okay, of the especially of the main characters. It is a very stylized form of drama and uh, helps us to focus the energy on the emotion rather on the individual personalities. In no as in classical ballet, every movement is choreographed and often symbolic. So, no theatre. So, while that was happening in Japan, what was happening in the um, western world, uh, one of the greatest works of literature, the death of Arthur, Maud the Arthur. Now, remember uh, Maud the Arthur, Arthur, it was uh, written by someone called Sir Thomas Mallory. Now, um, uh, the legend of the historical King Arthur, it was already in prevalence, it was it is an, a very popular um, romance okay. and uh, several people have attempted to uh, write their versions of the King Arthur's legends. So, uh, King Arthur's legends they have found uh, they have found echoes in the many chivalrous epics of the Middle Ages. Sir Thomas Mallory's Maud Arthur presents the complete legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, Merlin, Lancelot, and Guinevere. So, this is another landmark thing that um, landmark work of literature that you should be familiar with. You can be asked quotations from there, Sir Thomas Mallory's Death of Arthur. And while we were talking about Gutenberg's press, which was in Germany, printing press, in England what was happening? William Caxton's printing press. Okay, he was, he originally um, apprenticed to a London merchant, but in 1441 he went to Europe to study the new craft of printing. In 1476, mark the date 1476, he set up a printing press at Westminster. He was from Kent and he set up a printing press at Westminster, the first printing press in Britain. Caxton printed almost 96 works including the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and death, the death of Arthur, Maud Arthur. So, remember all these facts and historical landmarks. So, um, before rounding up, please look at the video here, Maud Arthur and here is the link. Thank you very much.